Hi, um, I'm Serena Pollastri, and my talk is about more than human places. Now, obviously, all places are more than human. They include far more than humans. But the thing is, for example, when you think of cities, cities are actually anthropocentric in nature. They have been designed to bring together communities of humans. And so when we think about the environment in cities, um, we tend to think of it in the context of how it affects human. And, um, you know, even so now, because in the last 15 years, policymakers and researchers have been talking about nature in cities as ecosystem services and as a way to identify the benefit that are provided by the natural ecosystems on human beings. So everything is about how we relate to nature and how nature in place uh, affects us. And in urbanism, because of this, there is a long tradition of planning nature in cities to enhance the well-being of its inhabitants. And the way we do that is through zoning. This image back behind me, um, it's a plan from 1898 um, of uh, one of the first garden cities. Uh, it's a speculative design that uh, reflected on how uh, Victorian cities didn't have enough green spaces. They were polluted and overpopulated. So Ebenezer Howard's uh, solution was to plan cities that were all um, zoned so that all the inhabitants could enjoy green spaces and fresh air. This um, sort of plan has been very inspirational for a lot of the urbanism in the last century. Um, this image behind me is a model of Le Corbusier Ville Radieuse, again, a city that was never built as such, but was very influential for other plans. And the principle behind this is what if we could have tall buildings where people could live together so we could have a lot of green space all around it and a lot of parks, a lot of trees and a lot of fresh and open air for everybody to enjoy. Again, these um, large green parks and very tidy rows of trees are injected in all of the most popular master plans. This is a quite recent one from master cities. Again, you see a lot of green space, a lot of trees. Everything is very carefully planned and zoned, and the trees are tidy all in a line. And they exist as like this green, lush landscape, even where there is no habitat for that. Um, this is a Google Earth image of Abu Dhabi and Mazdar City is on that plan. There's a desert. That plan is not coherent with the environment around it. Um, but the thing is that nature in city master plans is carefully planned and it's maintained. Um, it is tamed nature. It's not the um, you know um, it's not emerging on its own. It's it's very hev um, heavily maintained. And green spaces are identified and they are mapped within very defined boundaries. But these boundaries do not exist in reality. And we do not live in defined natural or artificial boxes, but within deeply entangled places. And much of the nature that pervades our everyday places defies our attempt to plan, systematize, or map it, or even understanding. Lichens, like the ones in the image, are everywhere. We rarely notice them, and we actually do not very well understand how do they live and how do they interact with the environment. The world is shaped by these interactions between non-human entities with human-made infrastructures. And these complex interactions happen at all sorts of scale and often have cascading effects that are beyond human control. Feral Atlas, uh, the image behind me, is a brilliant um, publication that tries to trace these entanglements and just tell stories about them and the unpredictable consequences that happened um, in these interactions. And so my research is about understanding how may we design tools and processes that help us understand and work within these messy entanglements. So 
in the last few years, I have been, for example, making maps that do not follow topography of place, but they tell the stories of personal journeys. So these are tools that uh, people could use to trace their personal journey through space, collect materials, found objects, add notes and uh, photographs to kind of like respond to what they experience in place. So it's not about mapping from the top, but mapping from within. We have been working in places that are shaped by the movement of tides, uh, which are impossible to map accurately, because there are no boundaries between land and the sea. And to do this, I worked with a cartographer who was trying to specifically understand uh, how do we map places that are cartographically impossible to map. And the solution was try to abandon the idea of creating a map with boundaries, but create maps at tools to have conversations about these entanglements. I also worked with uh, young people, and we designed tools for noticing plants in everyday environment and how understand how they relate to place. So working at the hyperlocal scale, scale, looking at the very small, looking at the green spaces that are actually within the cracks of pavements. We have been collecting samples of weeds to try and understand shapes and features of plants, and we've been making cyanotypes. And then, oh, sorry. And then we used what we learned through these processes to create with young people maps of places that are from the point of view of the plants. So places that have no boundaries as we define them in urbanism, but that reflect what we found there. And in general, we've been working on ways to visualize places that are much more relational and embodied than traditional maps. But yeah, they are not as accurate as the maps that uh, architects would use for their master plan of, are of maps that you can find to uh, walk around in cities. So why does this matter? Why should we even bother to do that? And when I was writing this presentation, I was um, reminded by the work of Dilip Dacunha, um, who um, says that rivers are designed. So he looks specifically at rivers, and uh, the thing with rivers is that when you represent them on the maps, you make two lines to define their boundaries. But these lines do not exist in real life. This map behind me is um, an old map of the Mississippi River that traces what was at the time the current, the contemporary uh, path of the Mississippi River, but also how the Mississippi River have been uh, seen to shift throughout the years. This map shows that there are no boundaries of the Mississippi River. Water is everywhere. Rivers shift and land shifts. So our attempt to capture it is political and it provides boundaries. And these boundaries are political. And um, Dilip Dacunha and Anu Matur's seminal work in landscape architecture have been questioning these boundaries and have been looking at what are the repercussions of um, a world where we define boundaries between nature and humans. And how can we actually question this boundary and create al alternative ways of doing architectural visualizations that disrupt these boundaries and these uh, conventions? And so, and this is where I'm trying to uh, continue my work, uh, trying to understand how to make sense, how to map and how to generate knowledge and how to create tools to generate knowledge about this entangled place as a way of creating a more um, relational understanding of them and avoid the idea of always having to have boundaries and always relegating nature in one box and humans in another box. Mm, that's it.